Good morning. We're back again. And the last time I told you that I may come back again to the book of Nahum before we leave it for now. And that is what I have decided to do. What we have done in many of our studies is to put a lot of emphasis and a lot of focus on Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, and the judgment that God pronounced against them. We talked about the judgment coming because God, who is sovereign, had decided that it was time to vindicate his righteousness by orchestrating fatal judgment against the Assyrians. And so we see a lot of material in just these three chapters that comprise this book. And so we can't escape details and all those things regarding Assyria when we read through here. So, what I was thinking is <clears throat> that since we presented our lessons with that kind of attention to Assyria and their wickedness and God's response to it, that when we saw the slow to anger God and that he was going to display his power in judgment, illustrated by reason and explanation. That's what we were, we looked at all of that. And we looked in some detail at that material. The book opens with the expression, a burden against Nineveh. And then we see in verse 13, in chapter number, I'm in, in the right, let's see, chapter 2, I'm sorry, in verse 13, where God says, I am against you, and he's speaking about being against Nineveh. And then again in chapter 3, and in verse number 5, we see that expression again, that God, he says, I'm against you. And so God was against Nineveh. Now, I'm going to read three verses of scripture, not from the book of Nahum. Listen to these verses. Psalm 24 and verse 1 says this, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all who dwell in it. That's the first one. The next one is from Romans 13 verse 1b. And here is what it says. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And then one more. In Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15 through 17. And here's what it says, speaking about Christ. It says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth at visible and invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities 
or powers. You might say, what does that have to do with Nahum? Here's what I thought. What if we consider these verses as a preamble to the book of Nahum? What if we did that? These verses provide a broader context for viewing the content that we have been studying in the book of Nahum. It would help us at the outset to see that there is more going on in the book of Nahum than a presentation about a wicked nation, Assyria, exceeding the bounds of God's grace and mercy. If we consider these verses as a preamble, then we see that more is going on than that. Although that is very significant, don't get me wrong in, in that. But what I want us now to do for a little bit, for a few, a few minutes, several minutes here, is to consider in this book of Nahum, the verses that speak and use explicitly the term either God, and I think that's just one time, or Lord, uh, and that's multiple times. And that goal there is to bring our focus to God as he is revealed here in the book of Nahum. So what I'm going to do now is read through verses selectively that have those specific words in them. And then I'll make a few remarks with regard to that. So now, we begin now again in verse number one of chapter one. And I think through verse three is the beginning of the first section where the Lord is mentioned. And I'm just going to read it, and then we'll, we'll consider. So beginning in verse 1, chapter 1, the burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. The next verse we're going to is verse number seven, still in chapter one. This verse says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. The next one is in verse number nine. Who do you, I'm sorry, what do you conspire, what do you conspire against the Lord? What do you conspire against the Lord? He's speaking to the Ninevites there, the Assyrians. In verse number 11, from you comes forth one who plots evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Verse number 12, it says, thus says the Lord, though they are safe and likewise many, 
Yet in this manner, they will be cut down. When he passes through, though I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more. Now, the next one is verse number 14, still in chapter 1. The Lord has given a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetuated no longer. Out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, for you are vow. Now in chapter 2, in verse number 2, it says here, The Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out, and they ruined their vine branches. Verse 13, still in chapter 2. For I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young ones. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. And then in chapter 3, and verse number 5, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift up your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Now, when we consider some of the things that we have looked at in this book about the judgment that was coming, we saw gruesome details about some of the things that would happen, that would transpire, just gruesome details. And we talked about how the Assyrians have been an especially brutal people, or we might say an exceptionally brutal people themselves in attacking the enemies. So if one was to look at those kinds of verses that, and those kinds of expressions in this, in this book, they could easily get a question to say, well, how is it that a good God could do some of the things that are reported here and attributed to him and what he would do with regard to the Assyrians? But with the proper context, the potential stumbling block dissipates. Because if we know and understand, beyond just looking at the judgment in the details as to how it would play out, we know there's more going on than just a judgment falling upon a people. Of course, we did look at the explanations for why the judgment was falling. Sometimes some people want to say, well, that's really not good enough from their perspective. But that as it is, however that may be. So then these verses that I have read that focused on God, from those, we can learn some of the things about who God is and what he's concerned about. And that's important, to know who God is and what he's concerned about. Because obviously, the Assyrians were concerned about something. <laughs> they knew things, and they had their concerns. But they were not concerned about the same things that God was concerned about. And they did not know this God who, whose character we can learn something about from just looking at the content 
that is given to us here. And I'm going to go back and look at a few of these. So when it says that God is jealous and that he avenges and it takes vengeance and it reserves wrath for his enemies, as we've said before, these sound like harsh things. And a tendency for us when we read these kinds of things is to think in terms of our individual emotions and our individual responses to things. And that can lead us astray in properly understanding what God is doing and who he is and what he is saying and what he's concerned about. So when this says that God is jealous, that is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Usually, when we are jealous about something, it's a bad thing. It's a bad attitude on our part. But for God to be jealous, it's good, because that means that that's his object of love, like Israel, the apple of his eye. And so he takes special care, special concern, and he will avenge those who mistreat and do them wrong. And he says that he will. And so we know then that God, so that's a character trait of God, that those whom he loves, he's protective of them. Protective. And also in verse 3 here, it talks about how it says he has his way. They talk about whirlwind, the storm, the clouds, the dust of the sea, and all that. And so this now is just put in bold relief that God is a God. It said here how you know, he's strong and he's powerful. So that the elements, the natural order, is within his domain, within his control. That the natural order can't do anything. Can it, it, well, it couldn't even come into existence apart from him. He brought it into existence. And he is a powerful God. So that these things can do whatever he chooses it to do. Because he's God. He is God. So we're learning he is God. And then... And I just love this one in verse 7, chapter 1, where it just says, the Lord is good. How much more do we need to say? The Lord is good. He is. But there are some who find themselves in various kinds of trouble at various times. The verse also says, he knows those who trust in him. That's, he knows. He's good. And he knows. His character is without demerit. His character is excellent beyond any human expression of excellency. And he knows. He is the omniscient God. He knows our hearts as well as he knew the hearts of the Assyrians. That's who that God is. He says in verse 14, he has given a command concerning you. Now, if God has given a command, just be settled in understanding that what he's commanded is going to happen. There's no question about that. That's just the way God is. That's who he is, and we see it that way. And this one in chapter 2, verse 2, it talks about the Lord restoring the excellence of Jacob. And this one has brought us in to see that what God is doing is more than just bringing these Assyrians into the judgment that is right and just. But there is here a word. He is still 
dealing with and working with his people, his chosen ones, his elect, the people of Israel. And here's a word for them, that God has something for them. And in spite of the fact that the Assyrians have been on their necks seemingly forever, the Assyrians were not going to win at the end of the day. The Lord, he, he said, he will restore. It's not going to be over with when the Assyrians are done doing what they will do. And so these kinds of things help us to draw our focus back again to God and say, well, God is the important one above all else that we learn and see here. We can look at the Assyrians and we can consider all that they did and we can see the examples and we can draw illustrations from it and we can draw applications, not just for ourselves but for nations because of how God has dealt with the nation. So one of the things though is, is that in the midst of all of this, and another thought I had when we were thinking about a broader context, I talked about Jonah some last time, but we see that God's grace and his mercy on display. And uh, as Second Peter 2.9, I think it says, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come uh, to a knowledge of his son and to be redeemed. So God, in mercy and in grace, and we saw that with Jonah, how it, these very people within 150 years prior, God has sent that prophet Jonah with that message of repentance. That's who God is. We see what kind of God he is in that. Because if we think about that, he's, for, he, he's concerned about the people, the nation. Jonah was clear-minded. He understood that the wickedness of the Assyrians deserved the judgment that God pronounced was going to come to them. He understood that. He was not misguided or misunderstanding about that. His problem was that as he testified that he knew what kind of God God was and that God is a God who exercises himself with mercy and grace. Now that's good because apart from that, none of us will be here. And it would be a horrifying not being here because there could be no good that could come in the end without his mercy and his grace. So God has demonstrated that by the time this judgment comes to the Assyrians, God has already exercised himself and demonstrated to them that he is a God of love, a God of grace, a God of mercy. And the people in that prior generation heard and repented sufficiently that the judgment was delayed. And then I think what happened is, is that for a time, as a nation, they were doing better. That's what I think. And then, perhaps when it seemed that the danger had passed, they just went back to their old ways and ramped it up a notch. And so the God got to the place where he said, you have exceeded the bounds of my grace and my mercy. That's not good. If one thinks and believes that God is a God of grace and mercy, what should we do with that? Should we just carry on as if there is no getting beyond the bounds of his grace and his mercy? Do we just carry on as if 
this knowledge that we have keeps us protected no matter what we do or what choices we make that we just go right on because that's what kind of God he is. Maybe the Assyrians thought something like that. But the knowledge is supposed to cause us to want to be in a right alignment with the Holy God. Because if we understand that this God is good and is merciful and is gracious and is long-suffering and is patient and is kind, what greater thing could we hope for than to be in a right alignment with him? What higher goal could we have that we could see in looking through Nineveh here and what we saw in this book and Nahum? And so we have a, a broad illustration. And so that God works and even in the most wicked of the nations, we can imagine of how the scriptures he could teach about a remnant. And so even when a bad nation is judging, we can believe that God has some in there who had not sold their souls, as it were, to the evil one, but who belong to him. There may have been in Nineveh, generations within families or smaller groups where they had passed down and had some come out who were even righteous when the judgment came and who survived that because they were right. So it's a nation thing, but it is also an individual thing. And so individually, we have responsibilities. But God has a plan for the nations and ultimately, the nations are going to be in a right alignment with God. The nations and all the people who be, will remain ultimately, who will be with him, will be in a right alignment. And so that's God. And so this whole idea then that if we think in this closing of our time addressing this book, with those verses I started with as a preamble to the book, and we look through that lens and we're considering, we have a God who created. We have a God who is sovereign. We have a God who, for him, all things were created that are for him. But not only that, he is also sustaining everything, even the wicked who rebel against him. Where do they get the strength and the wherewithal even to be able to do that? That's from God. He has enabled them. They misused it. But without him, they even could do nothing. There's nothing that could be done. So God is God, and he's teaching us through the book of Nahum that he is God and that we should look to him. So as I look back over this book and I keep thinking, and I keep thinking of uh, new and uh, other things, and I keep saying, you know, I think there's a whole lot more for even me to learn, having put the time in it. I'm, I'm assuming I put more time in this than most of you have over the weeks we've been looking at it. I mean, I, 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 well, I, I don't even know what the hours are. And it seemed like to me, I, I wonder if I'm even making a, a delible scratch in the surface. I think part of what that means is we don't leave the books and say, okay, we're done with that one. We just leave it to say, well, we're done for this particular way of, of considering it now. But in our personal studies, we go back and continue to look, not just for this book, but all books 
the whole scripture because we need to keep going and keep working at it and keep looking at it. I want to close with these words. It's from a psalm that's recorded in 1 Chronicles, chapter 26, beginning the verse 13. And here's what it says. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. And that gods is with a small case G, which means those are false gods out of worship. For the gods, still lowercase g, for the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples, Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. And let the earth be glad. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that is in it. Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. We will close there. And trust that this study has been, has been of some help to you as it has been to me. Our Father in heaven, we pause now again to say thank you. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, your grace, for extending that to us, each one, and for giving to us the privilege and the opportunity to have the word of the Lord, the living God, in our own language, where we can read, even without knowing the original languages, how great and wonderful is what we have through our translations, help us to honor and to respect that word and to seek it out so that the Spirit of God can work in us with freedom to accomplish your purposes in us. We ask in the name of Christ, our Savior, with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you much. Thank you, James. Uh, one part of his message that uh, caught my attention was when he emphasized the Lord is good. Was that verse 7? Verse 7. I thought I would look that up in my Bible and share with you a couple of other verses. Psalm 34, 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations this is from the ESV, because that's what I had handy on my phone right there. Jeremiah 33, 11 talks about uh, the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing, and they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Lamentations 325, 
Many of us know this. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Then, of course, Nahum 1.7 and 1 Peter 2.3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. I suspect you all have tasted that the Lord is good. Keep tasting, my friends. God has been very good and gracious to us. Thank you, James, for that series in Nahum. As our brother says, we don't leave Nahum. We just put him on the side for a little while, and we'll come back and revisit him again when the time comes. But uh, thank you for that. Lord bless you and keep you. All right, we are going to break for about 15 minutes, maybe 17, and uh, we'll be back. Uh, For those of you on the live stream, hang in there. All right, thank you.